um, energy WR and rejects uh, this QC plus WR to a uh, high temperature sink which is a TH and ultimately uh, this will be rejected to the ambient. For example, in a typical refrigerator, the refrigerator space inside uh, the refrigerator is your low temperature reservoir and the condenser which is kept outside is your high temperature reservoir. So, you, uh, you know that uh, inside it will be cold and outside is uh, the condenser will be hot and ultimately heat from the condenser will be rejected to the surroundings. So, in this uh, animation actually shows the temperature levels. For example, in a heat engine, the high temperature uh, TH will be much larger than uh, the TH of the heat pump uh, which is uh, larger than the TH of a refrigerator. Similarly, the TC of the refrigerator which will, will be much colder than the TC of heat pump which will be colder than the TC of a heat uh, engine. Now, let us look at uh, important uh, theorems called uh, Kano theorems. The so, Kano has, uh, he is a French scientist, a very famous and is uh, uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, the subject of thermodynamics and he has uh, studied the heat engines uh, extensively and he has uh, put forward two propositions or two theorems. What is the theorem 1? Theorem 1 says that it is impossible to construct a heat engine that operates between two thermal reservoirs and is more efficient than a reversible engine operating between the same two reservoirs. In, a, in simple words, let us say that we have two thermal reservoirs, one uh, high temperature reservoir and a low temperature reservoir. And uh, between these two reservoirs, just now I have shown you the heat engine, uh, two heat engines are operating let us say. And one heat engine is reversible and the other heat engine is irreversible. Now, what do we mean by a reversible heat engine? A uh, engine is said to be reversible if all the processes are uh, completely re reversible. Any uh, cyclic process will have several uh, individual processes and for the complete cycle to be reversible, all these individual processes have got to be reversible. So, a reversible heat engine consists of all reversible processes and again these uh, reversibilities should be both internally reversible as well as externally reversible. So, such a uh, heat engine is called as a reversible heat engine. So, between two temperature reservoirs, we have one reversible heat engine and one irreversible heat engine. Uh, the Kano's uh, first theorem says that uh, the efficiency of a irreversible heat engine will always be lower than the efficiency of a reversible heat engine. That means, uh, the maximum efficiency is possible only with a reversible heat engine operating between the same two temperature levels. So, this is the uh, first theorem of Kano. Now, let us look at the second theorem of Kano. Second theorem of Kano says that all reversible heat engines uh, operating between the same two thermal reservoirs have the same thermal efficiency. That means, like, again let us take the example of two thermal reservoirs and let us say that n number of uh, reversible heat engines are operating between these two uh, reservoirs. And the Kano's second theorem says that all these n uh, reversible heat engines will have the exactly the same efficiency. That means, the efficiency of a reversible heat engine is not the function of uh, how the cycle is constructed or anything as long as it is reversible, but is a function of only the temperatures of the reservoirs. That means, it is uh, reversible heat engine efficiency depends upon the high temperature uh, reservoir, uh, so it is the temperature of high temperature reservoir and the temperature of low temperature reservoir. It is only a function of these two temperatures and nothing else. This is a very important uh, theorem and we will see what is the consequence of this. So, these two theorems uh, uh, whatever have been stated now they are for the heat engines. You can uh, derive or you can uh, uh, formulate Kano's theorems uh, for refrigerators as well as heat pumps exactly on the similar lines. Now, let us see what is the consequence of uh, Kano efficiency for a heat engine the Kano efficiency is the maximum possible efficiency that means the efficiency of a reversible heat engine operating between two temperature reservoirs is given by the Kano efficiency n Kano and it, this is equal to 1 minus Tc by Th where Tc is the low temperature uh, heat sink temperature and Th is the heat source temperature. That means the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine operating between uh, a heat source at temperature Th and a heat sink at temperature Tc is given by 1 minus Tc by Th. Now, what uh, conclusions you can uh, derive out of this? Uh, uh, for example, you can conclude that the efficiency increases as the uh, Th increases. That means, higher the temperature of the heat source, you get higher efficiency. 
and another conclusion is that uh, the efficiency increases as Tc is reduced that means the lower the temperature of the heat sink higher will be the efficiency and what is the maximum possible efficiency if you have a heat uh, source which has a temperature of uh, infinity then you get maximum possible efficiency of 1 or if you have a heat sink whose temperature is 0 Kelvin then again you can, you can get an efficiency of 1. But we know that you do not have a heat source whose temperature is infinity nor you have uh, a heat sink whose temperature is 0 degrees uh, Kelvin absolute. So, since these two are not possible that means the efficiency of a uh, heat engine will always be less than 1 efficiency of a reversible heat engine itself will be less than 1 that means all actual heat engines will be less than much less than 1. So, this is the consequence of uh, the Carnot's theorem and uh, in uh, deriving this equation we had to apply uh, the first law of thermodynamics because uh, all heat engines uh, have to obey second law of thermodynamics that does not mean that they can violate first law of thermodynamics. So, for any process or for any cycle uh, to be feasible it has to obey both first law of thermodynamics as well as second law of thermodynamics and the efficiency here is derived by applying both these laws. Now, let us look at the uh, what is the maximum possible efficiency for a refrigerator and heat pump operating between two temperature uh, reservoirs Th and Tc. In case of refrigerators and heat pumps normally we do not use the term efficiency we use the term called coefficient of performance. Uh, in short it is COP, C stands for coefficient, uh, O stands for off and P stands for performance. So, the efficiency of any refrigerator or heat pump system is derived is defined in terms of COP. Now, COP of a Carnot heat pump that means the COP of a reversible heat pump operating between uh, two temperatures Th and Tc is given by Th divided by Th minus Tc and the efficiency of a uh, Carnot refrigerator is given by Tc divided by Th minus and again these are derived by applying uh, both first law as well as second law of thermodynamics and you can see here that the uh, COP is defined as the required output divided by the uh, effort that you are putting in. For example, in case of uh, heat pump the required output is heating output QH and the effort is work input to the system. So, the um, uh, COP is defined as QH divided by W and in case of refrigerator the required uh, output is cooling output. So, we are writing it as QC and the required effort is work input. So, we are writing COP as QC by W and it is very easy to show that the COP of a heat pump uh, will be equal to COP of a refrigerator plus 1 uh, from these equations. Now, let us uh, uh, define a very important uh, inequality ca called as Clausius inequality. This is in fact a mathematical form of second law of thermodynamics for a closed system undergoing a cyclic uh, process. This is proposed by Clausius and uh, it is known as Clausius inequality and it is simply given by the cyclic integral of dou q by t is, uh, is less than or equal to 0. So, this is what is known as Clausius inequality applied to a closed system undergoing a cyclic process. Now, what is uh, dou q? dou q is the heat transfer rate at the boundary the b the subscript b stands for the boundary that means heat interaction is taking place near the boundary and t is the temperature at which heat transfer is taking place. So, dou q is the heat transfer at the boundary and t is the temperature at which heat transfer is taking place. So, the Clausius inequality says that if you integrate this quantity dou q by t uh, uh, over the boundary for the entire cycle its value will always be less than or equal to 0. And this le less than uh, sign applies for uh, irreversible cycles and equal to sign applies for reversible cycles. That means, for a reversible uh, cycle the cyclic integral of dou q by t um, will always be equal to 0 whereas, for a uh, irreversible cycl uh, cycle the cyclic integral of dou q by t will always be less than 0. Clausius based on this uh, he has uh, arrived at a very important conclusion. I have mentioned that uh, the one of the characteristics of point functions is that their cyclic integral is 0. So, according to the Clausius inequality the cyclic integral of dou q by t uh, for a reversible process is 0 that means the dou q by t for a reversible process must be a point function that means it must be a property of the system and this property is known as entropy. And the Clausius inequality can also be used for deriving the efficiencies of a Kano heat pump or heat engine or refrigerator. So, uh, this is the summary of whatever I have been telling you. Uh, entropy of uh, Clausius has derived this property based on his uh, inequality, uh, and this property is called as entropy. And uh, the ent entropy change of a system during a process. Uh, 
For example, if the process is reversible, is given by this equation. That means s2 minus s1 uh, is equal to the integral of dou q by t. And internal reversible means that this process has got to be internally reversible. So, if you want to find out the entropy change uh, during an internally reversible process, you have to integrate uh, the quantity dou q by t uh, of, uh, from the initial state to the final state. And uh, in general for any process that means uh, for reversible as well as irreversible processes, you can write uh, what is known as an entropy uh, balance equation. Uh, for example, equation 4.18 where the entropy change S2 minus S1 will always be greater than or equal to the cyclic integral of dou q by t evaluated, evaluated at the boundary. Uh, and again uh, this uh, greater than sign holds good for an irreversible process and equal to sign holds good for a reversible process. So, this is again the follow up of uh, what we have concluded in the earlier slide. That means, for a reversible process S2 minus S1 is a cyclic integral of dou q by t, whereas for a uh, irreversible process uh, entropy change will always be greater than the uh, cyclic uh, integral, I mean the, I am sorry, uh, integral of dou q by t for the process 1 to 2. And the say above equation that means 4.18 can also be written uh, in this form that means you can also write this as uh, you eliminate the greater than sign and write this as S2 minus S1 is equal to integral uh, dou q by t from 1 to 2 plus sigma. Okay. And sigma is what is known as entropy production parameter. And for a reversible process, if you compare uh, the earlier uh, equation with this, uh, you know that for a reversible process sigma has got to be 0. So, for a reversible process S2 minus S1 is equal to integral dou q by t, whereas for an irreversible process S2 minus S1 has got to be greater than uh, dou q by integral of dou q by t that means sigma has to be greater than 0. So, sigma can be either greater than or equal to 0 and it can never be less than 0. Okay. Now, this gives a very important uh, conclusion or you can derive uh, uh, an important uh, principle known as principle of increase of entropy. This principle says that the entropy of an isolated system uh, always increases. So, that is what is shown in equation 4.23 that means entropy of an isolated system will never reduce and it will always increase. So, this actually defines the direction of the process um, uh, which a uh, isolated system can uh, undergo. And uh, what is the example of an isolated system? If you take the system plus surroundings itself as a combined system, then it becomes an isolated system. That means an isolated system can be a, uh, an isolated system in itself or a system plus surroundings. So, if you are writing the, uh, the entropy balance equation for a system plus surroundings, then also you get the same conclusion. That means entropy change of a system plus entropy change of surroundings will be equal to sigma uh, of the combined system and which will always be greater than 0. This is a consequence again uh, of the fact that in actual uh, practice uh, all the processes are irreversible processes. You cannot have uh, a completely reversible process. So, all these uh, irreversible processes generate entropy. So, one thing I would like to uh, point out here is that uh, uh, the quantity energy which was defined by the first law of thermodynamics is a conserved quantity. That means, energy can be neither destroyed nor uh, created. So, energy of an isolated system for example, if you take an isolated system, its energy will always remain constant because an isolated system can neither uh, or take energy nor give energy because there will not be any energy interaction. That means, its energy should always remain constant. So, this is the first law of thermodynamics for an isolated system. Whereas, the second law of thermodynamics for an isolated system that means, uh, which says that the entropy of the system should always increase. That means, entropy is not a conserved quantity and entropy of an isolated system always increases. This does not mean that entropy of a system has to increase. You must make a distinction between system and uh, an isolated system. For example, uh, if you look at a system plus surroundings, the entropy of a system can reduce for if it is rejecting heat to the surroundings let us say, then its uh, entropy reduces. At the same time, the entropy of the surroundings will increase because it is taking the heat from the system. So, the system is losing entropy and the surroundings is gaining entropy. But the sum total of the entropy chain that means entropy reduction in the system plus entropy increase in the surroundings should always be greater than 0. This is the principle of increase of entropy. Now, let me uh, quickly define the third law of thermodynamics. The third law of th the thermodynamics states that the entropy of a perfect crystal uh, is 0 at 0 degree Kelvin. Uh, that means, uh, at absolute uh, 0 temperature a perfect crystal will have uh, 
uh, zero entropy. This actually brings out another aspect of second law of thermodynamics, um, uh, namely uh, that of uh, order and disorder. We will see, uh, you might have uh, read in thermodynamics that uh, entropy is also a measure of uh, uh, disorder. A highly disordered system will have higher entropy compared to a highly ordered system. So, the entropy is an indication of disorder. And at 0 degree centigrade or 0 degree absolute theoretically all the motion ceases, so there would not be any disorder due to motion. And for a perfect crystal even the arrangement will also be perfect. Uh, so, a perfect crystal is a perfect example of order. Since it is perfectly in order, its entropy will be 0. So, this is a consequence of third law of thermodynamics. Uh, of course, at 0 degree Kelvin if you uh, achieve that uh, which is not possible, you will find that other materials will have non-zero entropies, uh, that means a positive entropies. Now, what is the use of third law of uh, thermodynamics? The third law of thermodynamics can be used for determining the absolute entropy of a system by taking the entropy value of uh, 0 at 0 degree Kelvin as a reference. So, this is a major uh, use of third law of thermodynamics and it can also be shown that uh, using the uh, consequence of third law of thermodynamics is that it is not possible to achieve uh, absolute 0 degree centigrade, uh, I mean I am sorry absolute uh, 0 degree Kelvin, uh, 0 Kelvin is not possible to achieve, this is one of the consequences of uh, the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing uh, here, uh, I have given the expressions for uh, Kano heat engine efficiency and Kano uh, refrigerator efficiency and Carnot heat pump efficiency and uh, we have seen that all these are functions of temperature and that uh, units of temperature there must be absolute that means you must use absolute temperature scale there to obtain the efficiencies of uh, Carnot heat engine, refrigerator and heat pump. You cannot use degree centigrade or degree Fahrenheit, you must keep this in mind. So, uh, this uh, completes, uh, this portion completes uh, uh, a half of the thermodynamics and we have to look at uh, how to evaluate the thermodynamic properties and what are the different thermodynamic processes, how do we evaluate the thermodynamic processes etcetera and these portions we will discuss in the next class. Thank you.